Okay, um, here is a uh, heart failure patient uh, who's had a TAVR as a pacemaker and uh, has mild lung edema and then has this uh, funny clip up here and um, has this funny little lucency tracking along here. So, heart failure. Mm. Let's look at some other images on the same on the same person. So here is an image taken uh, later on. I think this is today or yesterday. And you can see now that there is a lucency here in the aorta, which corresponds to an intraortic balloon. Um, and then if we look, we can faintly see there's a connection. There's a lucency that goes up above that aortic arch and heads toward this little clippy poo here. And uh, let's look at some other images in this in this person. If we look, if we go back to this image here, we see our clip up there in the in the neck, which turns out to be at one of the ends of the intraortic balloon. Now this intraortic balloon is upside down. It was put in from the axilla, and if you recognize this marker down here, this is 25 centimeters lower than the top marker. This is the extent of the intraortic balloon, and notice that there's a faint component. Uh, beyond the dense component of the marker at the end. And this is the actual tip. So this intraortic balloon was put in from the axillary artery. It's directed downward. And the faint part uh, that goes beyond the dense metal clip here tells us that this is the actual tip of the catheter. This is the distal aspect of the catheter, not the proximal, as you might assume, from catheters that are put up from below. This first time I've ever recognized the the, uh, the gas in the line going to the intraortic balloon, but obviously you don't want uh, what we saw in this in this case here, which is the balloon to be inflated, extending into the subclavian artery. So you don't want to be damaging the subclavian artery with this balloon that wants to be more than a centimeter in diameter. The subclavian artery is going to have a hard time accommodating a centimeter balloon. This is going to damage the artery. So this is not a favorable location. So if you just have this clip floating up here, you don't have gas in the balloon, it might be hard to recognize this as part of the intraortic balloon. This is actually the, the pro, proximal marker on the balloon. And I may have contributed to confusion in this case. When I first saw earlier images of this person, I thought that the intraortic balloon was too low. I'm, I'm not, not showing you an image that corresponds to that yet. So uh, here's, the, here's the balloon tickling the top of the aortic arch, so this is not a good position. But this, faint, and I didn't appreciate the faintness here, showing me that this is an upside down balloon with the tip actually down here. Let me show you an earlier image where we had proper placement, which is lower aspect of aortic arch for one of the ends of the balloon. It doesn't matter which end, but you don't want this thing getting up near the top of the arch. And on an earlier image, the, the uh, end was low here. So I might hold them to advance this balloon so that this would be near the bottom of the aortic arch, but advancing the balloon actually would cause it to go too high. Uh, I mean, they actually need to withdraw it to make it to make it go higher. So I didn't appreciate that this is an upside down balloon, and I might have, in my recommendation that they advance it, uh, actually giving them the wrong advice. So um, intraortic balloons still surprise me, and it's the first time I've recognized that this is a clue to the axillary placement, this gas in the uh, drive line for this balloon. For, okay, for they leave a little uh, catheter tip on the edge so we know it's a subclavian because they got tired of us calling them because for some reason, I, I would say they put about 50% of our, our IABPs in subclavian. And the, the proximal clip is always too high. Um, it's always above the, and we call them every time to like, dude, it's fine. That's where it should be. And I don't know if it's a different balloon, not as high as the one you showed, but above the arch. And they're like, and so they started leaving their little ca metallic catheter on the edge. So we, we would stop calling them about it. Um, so I, I, they say it's a different balloon, but again, I, I don't know. Well, I think, I think they're just wrong. When, when I've talked to the people, uh, most people who, uh, who are in charge of these things in the ICU don't really don't really know about them. There are a couple of experts. These are cardiologists who put them in. I talk to, and they're like, "No, it's fine." <laughs> so, um, I, I think I think they're just flat out wrong. You can tell by the caliber of this inflated balloon here that you don't want a balloon of that caliber, that 
that greater than one centimeter caliber in your subclavian artery. So ask them if they want it in their subclavian artery. Maybe that will focus their attention. Yeah, no, I, I we, again, we called like, literally we were doing like 10 calls a right. week on these. And um, they kept telling, I, I, again, they, they keep telling us they're fine when they're front there, when that tip is above, just above the arch um, on the uh, AP film. They say that's, that's okay. Cause they, they're saying that the balloon doesn't start for another centimeter or two distal to that um uh, on the their subclavian ones that doesn't start for another centimeter or two distal to that metallic clip that's okay. what they and i again i i don't know but uh it threw us for a loop for many a few months okay. i have a question why do they put them in with this approach i don't think i've ever seen one coming other than from a femoral approach how are you showing it um, I, I don't know. Lewis, do you know why they uh, throw these in like this? I mean, we've been doing it for about two years like this. Um, and I think ease of approach, um, uh, but I'm not sure. I think there are a couple things, at least no, the impellas that I was reading, when you put them in via the axillary artery, then it allows the patient to ambulate. Not that these patients are ambulating that much, but it's also less prone to infection than in the groin. Yeah, I've heard the I've heard both of those uh, rationales. I think it's it's obvious because I don't know the right answer in this case either. But it's obvious they never consulted a radiologist when they were in developing these things or considered how they might actually show up on imaging. Because yeah, it's just yeah, I don't understand where they're supposed to be either. And we have the same issue where we call and they say it's fine. Yeah, like literally, we were I was calling every day multiple times. I'm like, dude, the thing's still they're like, no, it's good. Stop calling. <laughs> well, when I actually talked to our experts on it, they agreed with me that you want these things, you don't want these things near the subclavian or carotid arteries. Yeah, no, so, you would not. Yeah. I, I, but, but I think that expertise is not widely shared in the people who are actually tending these patients day to day. You would hope they know where it goes when they're putting them in to assess the point, but. Because, yeah, ours, our proximal. Our, our uh, proximal uh, clip was always at the top, of the, like sitting right on top of the arch, like above it, just like where that, uh, um, and they would say, no, it's fine. The balloon doesn't start in full about two centimeters distal to that thing. We're, it's fine. Leave us alone. Um, but anyways. I think, I think one of the other problems is that if, if, you, if it's put in from the top, from the subclavian, and you want you want it to go lower you have to advance it and that involves then feeding a catheter that's exposed to the room that's contaminated into the patient so i think they're very reluctant to advance them from the axillary uh, approach yeah not sure okay well thank you david that's very fascinating i have to keep an eye out for these all right seth are you ready i am all right, welcome back, by the way. Thank you. Uh, all right, so this was a cool case I came across from uh, just looking at a pericardial drain. Whenever I see a pericardial drain, I'm always curious what the underlying issue is that led to the pericardial drain. Let me go to uh, thinner slices here. And you can see that... Um, yeah, this patient has a large pericardial effusion. Sorry, let me get the windows right. There we go. And, um, but the most conspicuous thing is this not so friendly looking mass that's sitting in the right ventricle uh, and right atrium. So it's kind of prolapsing across the valve. The bulk of it is uh sitting in the right atrium you know there's a good differential diagnosis when you just see this there there is a little bit of thickening sorry guys my internet must be slow i'm working from home today and uh it's a little slow it's jumping around there's a little thickening of the rv wall here but there's not the pronounced kind of you know with the angiosarcs there's a couple things that speak against angiosarc here one um Usually there's a more exophytic mass in the right AV groove um, that extends out and around, although I have seen ones with predominant intracardiac components, but there's just not a lot out here. Um, two, the pericardial fusion seems a little simple, not hemorrhagic. 
Uh, three, even though this is somewhat early pulmonary arterial phase, um, it's quite low attenuation. Uh, you would expect even during this early arterial phase, probably see some areas of enhancement in this. And then the best clue is probably, if you scroll up higher, you'll see all these kind of nasty nodes uh, sitting up here in the um, mediastinum. So the main differential when you see this would be either a, um, a metastatic lesion, which is always possible, uh, or let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah, it's not going to work for me. Or a, uh, a lymphoma. And this was a uh, cardiac lymphoma, uh, presumably secondary, given the fact that um, the patient had a uh, uh, lymphomatous involvement elsewhere. Um, and it could be really hard to differentiate primary cardiac versus secondary lymphoma, but she had lymphoma uh, throughout. She had lymphomatous involvement of her pericardium, uh, which again, you can see with primary, but uh, there's really no great way to differentiate primary cardiac lymphoma versus secondary. Secondary is just much, much, much more common. Uh, and the fact that she's got nodal disease outside of the heart would also speak to secondary. So that was an interesting case. And the low attenuate, I don't know if I mentioned the very low attenuation on the CT is kind of classic, although that's neither here nor there. Um, this is a case that uh, you know, always makes you a little nervous. Uh, this was a young patient who came in with a cough. And, um, you know, I'm showing it, it's normal. If you guys, I don't know, to me, I thought it was abnormal, but I, I don't know if you're shooting through a stack of films in the ER, if people would think that's normal. Does anyone see anything here? As it goes, esophageal recess. Yeah, they're exactly. Yeah, there's some, there's some. yeah there's isn't it? an interface there. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, do you, the weird thing is I don't see it on the lateral. Maybe you guys can point it out to me in the lateral. I don't see it. Um, what? It, no, not. I mean, if you do, please let me know. Like, I, I'm literally saying maybe you can point it out because I could not find it on the <laughs> lateral. Um, so this patient was sent home and came back. Um, about six months later with work, you know, four months later with worsening cough. And this is him now. And uh, you can see that the mass is still, I mean, now it's a little more conspicuous, but still subtle, but now we have the cat out of the bag kind of thing. Here's the CT. Um, yes, it's still the right case. And someone showed it to me and I, I, I thought it was going to be you know, young guy, it's a male, young male, um, anterior mediastinal mass, of course, you're going to put lymphoma into it, more likely a Hodgkin's lymphoma. But whenever I see uh, pulmonary mets to this degree, you know, I'm thinking maybe a malignant germ cell tumor. But there's some findings here that may put you more towards lymphoma. Again, I have a really slow connection. But some of these nodules have little air bronchograms in them. Um, not too many, a few of them. I'm trying to find one as I slowly scroll through this massive stack of images. Um, had air bronchograms. And, you know, that that's more commonly seen with lymphoma. Um, but, uh, you know, they. I still thought germ cell tumor was, was going to be just as likely. Uh, but this turned out to be actually uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Not a here's an air bronchogram, and not a not a Hodgkin. You know, you know, he's like guys like 20. So you know, we often think of Hodgkin's or sorry, non-Hodgkin's as kind of older patients. Um, we know that uh, Hodgkin's has a bimodal age distribution occurring in kind of younger patients, but also very old patients. But this is kind of a young age for uh, for non-Hodgkin's. But just a subtle finding on a portable radiograph, and um, you know, bad, well, rapid. I'm sorry, Dave. Um, I mean, I'm sorry. sorry. Howard? On the CT, sorry, on the CT, that doesn't confirm subcoronal lymph node enlargement. Did we make an observation that didn't really pan out in that respect? Yeah, that so that's right. So you're, I think we were faked up. I wasn't sure yeah. the shadow on the 
initial radiograph was so, something in the anterior mediastinum faking out to look like it was subcarinal, um, or if it was truly a normal study. Um, it's, I, I, I think it's wondering. a fake out. I was wondering the same thing because you know you can have a big superior pulmonary vein right in, and he does have a big superior pulmonary vein, um, and I I was wondering the same thing because I couldn't localize anything to the anterior mediastinum, uh, and I saw that and I didn't see anything on the CT as you very closely pointed out. So I figured it was some anterior mediastinal fake out, but maybe it's just a big vein shadow. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's the anterior mediastinal mass. I think it's real. I don't know. Uh, no, yeah. We can look at the We'll never know if I feel safe doing that. Yeah, no, and it's, <clears throat> you know, and to me, it's like I should see something on the lateral, but anyways, um, I, I think it would, have, it would have been a tough call, and it, it, it maybe. Oh, Seth, if, Seth, can you put the lateral back up one second? I, I shall. There you go. Yeah, the lateral does not support my anterior or posterior mediastinal mass. No, no it doesn't. Yeah, there's negative. nothing. Nothing there. I mean, nothing there. so, anyways, interesting case. Very, and that was in uh, that difference in time was just a few months, like two or three months between the two. Um, but he had did have a chronic cough, kept going away, and he kept bugging his primary care doctor, and eventually went back to uh, the ER, and then had all these other findings that were bad. Uh, this is a nice. <clears throat> a classic radiograph of a subcrinal, lobulated subcrinal mask. Um, the interesting thing here is the patient, I, I thought I downloaded it, but I didn't download it. Uh, here you can see it on the lateral, um, where the patient had a uh, CT of the chest a few years before, or not CT of the chest, uh, uh, chest x-ray a few years before, and there was nothing there. I still think it's going to be just I mean, it's a pretty classic look and location. I, I she came in with acute or kind of subacute pain, acute pain. I, I think it's just an infected forward gut duplication cyst. Uh, path is still pending. She's probably going to go to surgery sometime uh, in the next few weeks. But um, you know, I don't know. You always have to. You know, we suggested maybe an MRI, um, but I think they're just going to go in and take it out. But I, I think it's a pretty good characteristic look for an infected, probably an infected bronchogenic cyst, but maybe, maybe we're, we're wrong, but it's a great location for it, obviously. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how much an MRI would add. It would just, I mean, you know, it's cystic already and it might show some enhancement, but either way, they're going to have to take it out. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, that's what their thoughts were. And lastly is a case that's itself is not super exciting in the sense that it's a, just a case of um, endocarditis. Um, but what is interesting, and I think I figured you guys would really like if I can get it over to the valve. A um, uh, little motiony, but you guys can clearly see that there is a uh, portion of contrast outside the valve. So this is a homeless guy who had a bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, you can see this extends clear pseudoaneurysm uh, wrapping around the aortic root here. Uh, he went to surgery and unfortunately died. So he was a homeless guy. He had been living on the streets of San Diego for a couple of years um, and had been sharing kind of blankets and pet cats and other things. And our ID guy was uh, pretty concerned it was going to be Bartonella, um, maybe from the cats. And this actually turned out to be Bartonella quintana, which is what causes trench foot, um, which you get from lice and other louses that not only you can get from sharing blankets, but also um, from, from potentially lice and other bugs that live on cats. So uh, they did a whole serology. A serology was quite abnormal for the Bartonella Quintana. And then here's the, I don't know. Th I think the black things are little bugs. <laughs> this, this is a Steiner stain, which I've never heard of, which I guess is pretty good at picking up these bugs. And I, I don't know, but they sent, they sent the valve specimen to University of Washington to you guys, and they confirmed it was Bartonella Quintana with RNA and so a whole bunch of other stuff. So I don't know if you've 
you know, this can cause is a known cause of endocarditis. Um, and it's, I ju it's just one of these bugs I've not ever seen outside of, you know, history books. I, I don't know if you guys had ever no. seen this before. What, what it's, caused the, what caused the, um, the person to tumble, to insist on this diagnosis? Um, he, he thought it was going to be Bartonella Hensley. He thought it was going to be, because he worked, he lives with cats, he like is homeless, but he has like sleeps with a whole bunch of feral cats and feeds them and they've occasionally scratched him. And so they thought it was going to be um, Bartonella. And it was interesting because they sent out a Bartonella Hensley, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I, I never know, um, titer. And it came back like un, not negative and not positive. It was like some sort of in, uh, indeterminate, something was wrong and they couldn't figure it out. So then they said, oh, maybe it's another species of Bartonella. And they specifically sent out the Quintana assay, which came back positive. But I think they were thinking more on the cat side than the this specific disease or uh, bug. So you guys like bugs. I don't know. To me, it's just endocarditis. But uh, I guess it's extremely rare. They wrote it up in a case Is your report. first Bartonella? Uh, endocarditis. It's mine. It, I mean, it's the first one that I, and this, the only reason I knew about it is because I was talking to the ID guy randomly yesterday and he said, oh, you read a study. I remember your, because we had never met. And he's like, oh, I remember your name. You read the study on this guy we did a case report on. It's like, oh, you should have asked me for images. Um, but anyways, uh, I, I, the answer is yes, but that's because I usually don't find the bugs in terms of searching it out. But uh, anyways, interesting, uh, hey. interesting specimen. Yeah, cool, thanks. All right, that's it. All right, me. thanks, Seth. All righty, who wants to go next? I can go if you like. All righty. So this is a very interesting case, and um, it's definitely somewhat speculative. It is speculative on my part, but there are quite a few lines of evidence that point towards the plausibility of this diagnosis. So it's a case of cystic lung disease. It's a 46-year-old person, man. So I'll show you the cysts. Yes, there's motion and sharpness. I think we all appreciate thin walled, rather large cysts. Um, it would be reasonable, I think, to think of Berthog Dubay and inquire as to the plausibility of that diagnosis. But here's the really interesting history, and that is apparently he had cystic disease diagnosed in the neonatal period, very close to his birth. So very early in life, and apparently some were resected, or one or more was resected, and there are some surgical staples there. So resection of cysts in very early childhood, and then there was some obscure history of kidney lesions. So let me show you the now calcified kidney lesions. Now, I wish I had the imaging, if they did imaging way back then, but he's 46 now, calcified lesion there, some calcifications there, and there's one here. So he's got some curious calcified renal lesions. So cystic disease, very early childhood, sufficient to result in some surgery. How do you put all that together? So let me bring this up, because I think this is the case of cystic pleuropulmonary blastoma regressed. So let me show you, this is the article that I'm going to bring up. And I'll just scroll through some of the highlighted portions. So basically there are three types, the cystic, solid, um, cystic and solid, but there's one type that progresses, or rather doesn't progress, it's cystic disease, and that's called R, regressed. So type one, R, regressed cystic spaces. 
is one type of lesion. That describes it a little bit more. I'll just scroll through that. Um, sometimes they present with a pneumothorax, but what I want to show you here is a comment that sometimes these are not diagnosed typically in early childhood, and there is an association between this ent entity and the DICER-1 germline mutation entity. Now, we now know that DICER-1 um, is a cancer predisposing condition. We can get cystic nephroma, and I would speculate, I wonder whether he had cystic nephromas that basically, and that's a benign lesion, regressed or calcified. As you can see here, they have other kinds of tumors, or they may have other kinds of tumors. And with respect to the possibility of diagnosing it with cystic lung disease later on, an older individual or a relative, most likely type 1R. Metastatic disease never been found with type 1, no need for metastatic workup. So that's speculative, but it's very intriguing because of that history that he might have this thing. And I certainly have never seen one before, but I asked one of my pediatric colleagues and he said he diagnosed it once in a, I think a 18 year old patient once, but certainly not in the 40s. So I don't know what to, I mean, you just have to have that history to potentially suggest that he might have this entity. Now, um, because he's older now, they didn't feel the need to pursue the germline mutation analysis in this patient because of his age, which is quite reasonable. So kind of speculative, but again, some evidence to indicate, at least historically, that he might actually have this entity. So pleuropulmonary blastoma cystic type 1 or regressed entity. So I thought you'd like that. It's not that, I don't know what it is. Um, this is a person that I showed once before because I have a follow-up, I'll just show it to you again. It's a person with a Sjogren's disease, Sjogren's syndrome. And <clears throat> what is really interesting about this patient, and we've shown these before where we have thin wall cystic lesions, is the amount of bronchiectasis actually. And if you look at these bronchi as I scroll around, yes, there are some other cystic spaces and opacities, but the bronchiectasis is really quite intriguing, how thin walled the bronchiectasis is. So that is back in 2015. And the most recent that I have is this one from last October. And it looks very much the same. Some of the bronchi are a little bit more dilated over a period of years. So again, the combination of parenchymal cystic spaces, very interesting pattern of thin walled, I call it thin walled bronchiectasis, and some other opacities that may represent amyloid and so on. So that is a really nice image showing you the bronchiectasis and the other findings. So protein deposition in the lung producing both the pulmonary cystic spaces and in this patient, the bronchiectasis. Very interesting case. Howard, do you have a mechanism for why there should be bronchiectasis? I mean, well, it's amazing wall, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah. a striking pattern. I think, um, can one speculate that maybe the elastin in the bronchial walls is digested? And Got it. that structural component of the bronchial walls is just digested just away and the bronchi just kind of dilate because the walls are thin. I think that's I, a possible explanation. I think that's a really good that's a really good explanation because it seems to be like a pure elastase process rather than an inflammatory process. So because there's not the inflammation that we see with most infected bronchiectasis, we don't get the wall thickening. We just digest the elastic tissue. I think that's a great explanation. Yeah, that's a plausible one, I think. And protein deposition in the bronchi has, has been described before. One can find a case report or two where they've shown the light chains and the, the matrix metalloproteinase 
in the wall of an airway. So it's pretty plausible, I think. This is the most interesting one I've seen by far in that respect. So this is over a period of five years or so. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me just show you this one in reverse order because there's nothing that um, striking about this is just an interesting observation. So let's say that um, you came across this CT and you didn't have any history of comparison. Uh, what might you think about that opacity in the left lower lobe? It's uh, not quite spherical, but it contains airways within. The airways are a little bit distended. So there's a little bit of bronchiectasis, mild. And then I'm going to just make a map out of this just to show you these vessels here. So these vessels are curling into that, sort of like we sometimes see with rounded atelectasis, and we call it the comma tail sign. So you can see the vessels wrapping in, drawn in towards this thing. So we have a focal cicatrization process associated with some architectural distortion and some more generalized volume loss in that lobe. So this is radiation fibrosis. Here is an image from before when the tumor was diagnosed and then treated. And there were some images over time showing the evolution of more acute radiation change here, but now the evolution of this. Now, I just thought it was kind of cute, a comma tail type sign in a person with radiation therapy. So the radiation therapy was in 2018. And I think this, you know, if you read a lot of oncology CTs, I think those of us that do will recognize just an image like that to think of radiation therapy because of the presence of the airways within that are slightly dilated, cicatrization, bronchiectasis, a little architectural distortion, and so on and so forth. So I thought I'd share that one here. Okay, Jeff, that's mine. All right, thank you. Uh, Peter or Travis? Jeff, I got one. Okay. Quick one. And I've, I've got two that I can show pretty quick after Peter. Sounds good. I'll save you some time. Um, so this was a CT I read um, a few days ago, uh, uh, and it was a PCT, and um, it was yeah, so PCT. Um, uh, patient's 42 years old, and right off the bat, you can see um, the heart looks pretty abnormal. Um, it looks like a congenital case, um, but. The interesting thing is that there's no um, sternotomy, so this is unrepaired. And so um, there's no pulmonary embolism, by the way. Um, and so just taking a look at the um, uh, congenital uh, case here, um, this has this has um, the features of um, the tetralogy of um, Fallot. So a very good example of um, an overriding aorta here over the septum. Um, there's a clear VSD. The right ventricles very hypertrophied, and um, and then um, and then looking for the uh, pulmonary arteries. So this is actually a case. This is actually a variant of uh, of um, tetralogy with a uh, pulmonary atresia. Let me try to find. So, so the, the pulmonary artery is completely atretic here, um, and um, so there's no anti-grade flow from the RV into the pulmonary artery. And um, the interesting thing also here is that he has all these. Uh, he's developed all these uh, mapcas which are supplying the pulmonary circulation. And the most, so 
all these circuitous vessels coming off of the aorta into the pulmonary vessels on both on both sides. Um, the one thing I wasn't completely sure about is there's one uh, structure right here, and I'm not sure if this is a just a very large PDA or if this is just another MAPCA. So if this is a PDA, this would be um, this would have allowed for development of uh, if this is a PDA, then you can assume this is the right pulmonary artery which developed because it got blood supply from a PDA, or this could just be a large MAPCO. So it looked a little like too another MAPCA. What's that? It looks like another map got yeah it didn't look in the right it didn't look at the right position for uh the pda it yes not, it's not in the region of the ductus so i i would yeah. say yeah big, and you so also have the, the bonus of the the retro aortic brachius valic vein there too i don't know if you mentioned that earlier or not i might have missed it but it passing you behind the the, you can see that with the contrast in the brachius valic vein right there is going behind the ascending aorta yes 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 i didn't mention that yeah. but yeah yeah, which we've seen in a few tet yeah. patients and then there's a right arch also yeah cool uh, but this so this variant uh with the uh this variant of um so this is the most uh extreme variant of um, tetralogy with the uh complete uh, pulmonary atresia and um, they do form mapcas uh, but i've never seen a case of one of these uh, as an adult no it's unrepaired um, the patient actually came into our hospital so he doesn't have much follow-up in our hospital but he came in um, because he developed right upper quadrant abdominal pain, and he had this uh, right upper quadrant uh, abscess. You know, it's I have to say, of the ones that I have seen coming in as adults uncorrected, for me, a large percentage of them are these pseudo coarchs, um, or the sorry, the pseudo truncus with the um, mm -hmm. with the mapcas. You know, that that whatever they called it, the type four or whatever they used to classify this as. Um, yeah, for some reason, I, I've seen a lot of these present as adults mm -hmm. and i, I don't my know. understanding is that the map because they're basically what allowed them to go uncorrected right yeah go uncorrected and they just kind of you know eventually will need a probably need a transplant heart lung transplant because mm -hmm. they have pulmonary hypertension yeah uh, but like for some reason i i've seen probably four or five of these kind of present out of the blue in their 30s and 40s um you know anyways so yeah Another interesting thing, Peter, is um, this severe form of TED is also associated with a chromosomal abnormality. I think it's the 22Q11 deletion, which I don't know if there's other other things associated with it, but it's the one that can be associated with, like you said, the pulmonary atresia and uh, mm -hmm. the right double right aortic arch pyramid branching and these large map because. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Very impressive uh, calcified plaques in those vessels in the arteries too all over the place yeah i believe yeah. right there yeah and you can see how large wow. these uh, vessels are in the lungs they almost go to the periphery of the lung but Peter, how old is this guy 42. Hmm. i don't think that's i don't think that's clot you, you say clot or you say atherosclerotic disease Oh, I was thinking calcified atheroma in the pulmonary arteries. No, oh, yeah, 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 that exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah there's the no, there was yeah. no clot. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no clot. Sorry, atheroma calcification. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Ooh. Very impressive. Thank you. That's all I got. All right, thanks. All right, Travis, you ready? Sure. Okay, should see a radiograph here. This is a portable history pre-op. And I'll show the next one, which was done, whatever, 12 hours, 14 hours later. He is now post-op, and you can see there's a surgical drain over his right upper quadrant. And when you're going through the stacks, it's maybe easy to overlook the other thing, which is this right here. And this was noticed, and it's kind of curious because it looks kind of like a bullet. And then we'll go to the next radiograph, and clearly it wasn't there before. And this is the next, this is saying four minutes later, and then it's still there. This is the next day, it's still there. So, and it wasn't there pre op, and this guy had a liver transplant. So, what do you think this is? Um, is it from the donor? Yeah, he got it from the gunshot from the donor. That's why he got yes. the transplant. Yeah, exactly. 
it's, it is it is in fact a bullet that was in the donor liver which you know i know they won't even take donate like lungs here that have even a small nodule that's not clearly an intrapulmonary lymph node i'm surprised that this patient managed to receive a liver that has a bullet in it but i don't know i just thought that was a kind of interesting in the case and just a reminder to like look and explain everything you see on the image was wow. was was the reason that the guy uh, was such an effective donor that somebody shot him did he have bullets no, elsewhere? I, yeah i have no idea you know and i can't find out that information they're not linked uh, but i will say the one issue with this because this patient had cirrhosis and had I think maybe have had a hepatocellular carcinoma, like a small one that still kept him on the transplant list. But this has proved proven to be kind of a pain for him because he can't get regular MR follow-up of his liver just because of all the, the artifacts. So it's actually not just sitting there inert, it's causing problems with his follow-up care. But you know, I just thought it was, you know, it's a nice one to show your residents. NS. Now this this one I need help with. I will show you. So this is a patient who is in her 60s, as you can see, and was diagnosed with adenoid cystic carcinoma of the head and neck years ago. I, I don't know how many years. It's been a few. And this was a pet from 2019. And there there were a few of these little you know, subsolid nodules. Here's here's another one right here. And they weren't obviously weren't caught on the pet. And so the 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 pet folks reasonably said you know, these could be little adenocarcinoma in situ, you know, of lung primary, continue to follow. This is two years later. This is when I first saw this patient back in November. And check out what this nodule, this one still looks pretty similar. But you'll notice there's this thing right here, which has like a, it's got like a, a double rim ring target appearance. And this one too, this is like one of the, strangest morphologic nodules I've ever seen with like multiple rims of soft tissue and then that central soft tissue there. And you know, I've never seen a lung adenocarcinoma look like that. And here's another one. There were at least three that looked just like that. And they were all small ground glass nodules before. I told the surgeon such because she had never been shown to have metastatic disease. And I said, I don't know if these are adenocarcinoma or if they could be nets from her adenoid cystic carcinoma, but here's the patient elected not to have surgery, but yesterday got another follow-up that I happened to read, which is why it reminded me of this case. And these things are getting bigger. And look at that. Has anyone ever seen a nodule like this other than like an angiosarcoma metastasis? Never. Just kinda, Wasn't there it's, a... It's just, wheel and spoke or some kind of sign described with adenocarcinoma and i think a paper from japan i don't know i'm not I've, seen adenoid I've cystic look like that look like this of lung primary and i'm not saying it's not i just think that they can't treat it as presumed multifocal adenocarcinoma and right. hopefully they're going to agree to to have one of these resected yeah. but i just thought especially this nodule is just one of the crazier looking things i've ever seen yeah, I've I've seen adeno, adenoid cystic mats, but they're not that common. But they typically look kind of solid or cavitary or sort of cauliflower like, not not sort of solid. solid. It's slow growing too. Yeah, it's usually pretty you know, like grow over years, and that's why the other thing I was wondering because these have it's been two years and they're just very slowly growing. But I was just curious because hopefully I will get follow up this and can share with you guys. Was she getting uh, chemotherapy or anything like that for her adenoid cystic? I'll have to look. That's a good question. Because I kind of wonder if these are like growth arrest lines or, you know, reflecting <laughs> yeah. or some, something that would. Good question. I, I actually will look that up. But uh, okay. right now, while, while Jeff goes, that's a, that's a great thought. I know she got surgery and, and radiation. I think adenoid cystics don't usually respond well to chemo, but I'll mm -hmm. look and see maybe, maybe some sort of immunotherapy. But great question. Now, I did see a case that looked like this that was a lung adenocarcinoma last week on an outside case. And really? I don't, okay. I didn't write it down, but it was a single lesion. It wasn't multiple like this. Okay. And a spoke wheel appearance, huh? Wow. 
Oh, Jeff, you said it's like wheel and spoke appearance. Yeah, I know there's one described with like renal cell, but I wonder, I, I just vaguely remember something about it in the lung, but or something like that, a wagon wheel maybe, I don't know. I'll have to do a lit search or something. But I've not seen one, so I, maybe I'm just thinking something else. But I know they've described it with renal cells before. Okay. seen the screen yet. Let's try this again. All right. So um, this first case is not an uncommon disease, but I think it was a, it's a less common manifestation. So patient presents, um, you can see a, with a cough, you can see a bunch of nodules. They're pretty large and they're sort of centered in the central lungs. Um, and kind of clustering together and fairly symmetric. Uh, we don't see much else. The hilum maybe are a little plump there, but um, go to the lateral real quickly just to show them sort of clustering them uh, sort of centrally in the lungs there. So here's the CT scan, and we see that indeed there are all these really rounded nodules, um, but definitely as we look, they're starting to conglomerate together. I think there's a, let's see, the yeah, the CT is about a year and change older than the radiograph, um, but it was a good radiograph. But we can see they've started to coalesce, uh, but they're clustering together and they're predominantly in a perilymphatic distribution. So uh, this is sarcoid, but I'm showing it because I've seen large nodules in sarcoid, but not large perilymphatic nodules like this. And I've seen conglomerate nodules of sarcoid, but these look like just really, really, I mean, um, each one of these individually was not your typical sarcoid nodule. And, you know, we see coalescent little ones sometimes giving the bigger ones or more spiculated ones. And I, I don't recall seeing too many cases or even one with this degree of larger nodules. But the distribution, again, even if you didn't have a diagnosis, would be very key. So uh, sarcoid with really large perilymphatic nodules. Has anyone else ever seen this pattern? No, that's a quite. Quite it, you know, it's Jeff, it's on my list of things that can ready up from the hyla and that flame-like distribution, you know, classically Kaposi sarcoma, but also lymphoma mm -hmm. and sarcoid. Yep. And I think you've got a little bit of that sort of flame-like radiation from the hyla going mm -hmm. on here. It doesn't quite, it, it doesn't quite taper from the hyla the way I, I would like, but I think it's the same idea. Yeah, yeah. But like in each individual nodule almost looks more like a hematogenous metastasis than it does your typical sarcoid nodule. So I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, this is a 67-year-old um, who had a lung nodule. And that's not why I'm showing the case. But yeah, this was just for a, a, a nodule down here that's growing that may be a cancer. And there's probably there's some inflammatory stuff. And there's probably an adenocarcinoma up there. But what caught my attention was that was the trachea. So if I started up here, if we scroll down, you'll see there's a couple little bumps along these cartilaginous rings. And there's another one there. And these aren't too subtle. You see them over and over again. But you'll notice they're confined only to the anterior and lateral wall. And then we kind of lose them once we get to the carina. So I think this is just a little bit more exuberant than what we sometimes see just in, and sort of ignore of tracheobronchopathia osteochondroplastica, these little hyperplastic nodules. Um, I emailed the uh, pulmonary fellow who did the bronch yesterday and asked her if she noticed anything. And she said, no, she didn't really, nothing particularly caught her attention in the trachea. I suspect because they were doing a biopsy, they just look, were looking, they weren't looking for the little ridges on the trachea itself. Um, but um, so, I don't, they're not papillomas or anything like that. So I think this is a nice example of TBO, which you know, is always in, I see written down in differential diagnoses for cart, you know, um, posterior membrane sparing tracheal disease. But I think I've only seen one case ever that Arlene shared with me probably like eight or nine years ago with more large chunky uh, lesions protruding into the lumen. But this is more exuberant than I typically see. And I'm, I almost always ignore this. Mm, interesting. Everyone agree with that diagnosis or whatever we want to call it, a condition? Yeah. 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 Maybe a mild form of it, yeah. Yeah. So, sometimes the little nodules that protrude into the lumen actually have the cartilages calcification in them, mm -hmm. which helps, helps you nail it. Cool. 
I've only been asked one time by a pulmonologist uh, where they saw them on bronch and asked me what I thought they were. I, I was kind of surprised they're, they're less familiar with the condition, but considering, I mean, I, I swear, especially in, in patients who smoke or have chronic like can, obstructive lung disease, we see these little bumps all the time, but I always ignore them. Uh, this is an interesting case. This is a young patient uh, who was referred for a mediastinal mass that was called elsewhere. You can see she's got this homogeneous mass in the prevascular space, just kind of hanging out there, not doing much. Um, and so she was sent for a PET CT here. Um, I'm not a huge fan for PET CT for um, mediastinal masses, but um, you know. Nevertheless, you can see there is some activity in it, but it's not particularly that high. And I was consulted on this case because uh, the working diagnosis before the PET was lymphoma. I'm not, I'm not sure why. Again, it was an outside referral, so we don't have any history. But you also notice there's quite a bit of thyroid uptake, and the thyroid is pretty juicy. And so when I saw oh, this, yeah. to me, yeah. this looks just like a really <laughs> big thymus. Um, you know, there's no yeah. fat really, there's a little bit of fat around, but it's just kind of hanging out there and it kind of wraps around. So I, I thought this looked more like thymus and really didn't look like lymphoma. And it would be really unusual for lymphoma to have that low FDG activity. Um, but if you look at her thyroid, it's quite large. So uh, we were able to track down some records and lo and behold, she, she has hyper para, uh, hyperthyroidism, presumably Graves disease, and it's getting ready to start treatment. And so of course there is a uh, relationship between autoimmune thyroid disease and thymic hyperplasia. So I think this is a case of thymic hyperplasia. Now, whether it's lymphoid hyperplasia or just true hyperplasia, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know. But I don't think a biopsy is indicated. Um, but we just rarely get to see one on PET like this. So I think this is thyroiditis and reactive thymic hyperplasia. I was going to say, you could yep. make the diagnosis of Graves' disease almost yes. based on the CT with the thymic hyperplasia. Yeah. We had a case like that a few years ago, and it kind of followed the same trajectory where they called it lymphoma outside and ended up coming to us, fortunately, for MR rather than PET, but yeah. still. And, and this is a big deal, especially for this patient. I mean, any extra test is always a big deal, but you'll notice here she required, this is an LMA, uh, and for whatever reason, I didn't get into it, required general anesthesia for the PET CT. There may be some, I don't know if there's any neurologic or psychiatric disorders, but you can imagine trying to do a biopsy or an MR, it'd just be a, be a lot of unnecessary work. So, um, but yeah, I know we've seen a couple cases of this before, but I thought this was a really nice example and a good pitfall, both on CT, but also PET CT, if you read those and are familiar with the relationship between thymic hyperplasia and Thyroid. And it's not just Graves' disease, but also Hashimoto's. Uh, let's see. This is a 64-year-old. Um, oh, this is a really cool case. So this is my cool bug case. Uh, not what I was expecting. So this patient had uh, an aortic stent graft placed uh, for an aneurysm. And you can see there's the graft. Um, and it was a combined um, uh, endovascular and open procedure. They did an open portion for the thoracobdominal aorta. Um, but you'll notice the patient presented with dysphagia and some, I think, some low-grade fever. So on this CT, you see there's this collection here, and there's the esophagus. And um, so it looks like an abscess. It's got a wall around it, and it's kind of yucky looking on the inside, a little bit of soft tissue and um, all of that. Um, but we were trying to uh, – I was consulted on this one uh, by one of our surgeons because um, the question was, is this coming from an esophageal injury or is this coming from the aorta? And, of course, every party wants the other parties to be, it's their problem. But uh, I, I settled on this being part of the graft because there's this little pledget or felt here, and that's clearly floating in the abscess. And that was, um, I don't have it shown, but that was on the, uh, the earlier post-operative CT. So this is part of the aortic repair before this abscess developed. So I'm, I'm pretty convinced that this, this, this graft, this little pledget is floating in there. They did do an esophagram. It was normal, just showed the, the mass effect. So the surgeon ended up deciding to take a sub, uh, an upper a transhiatal approach to get in there because it really wasn't a good CT route to get a needle in to sample this. So they did a laparoscopy and were able to get a um, get up in there and drain it out and put a drain in. Um, but what's interesting is what organism this grew. Anyone anyone want to guess? Can't even guess. No. <laughs> it was Coxiella it Bernetti. So the harder it is to pronounce, you have to get David pronounce it. Yeah. What, what was it? Coxiella bernetii, so Q fever. 
what? Hey, that's what I said. But yep, nope. That's what it. That's what. That's what was in this. Thing. I don't know where it came from. I've seen maybe two cases of Q fever ever, and they cause pneumonia. I've never seen an abscess. It's just not a common organism. But that's what it is. But I, I thought it's a neat case from from two standpoints. I mean, it's a cool bug, but it's a it's an unusual complication. But I think the clue here is this little pledget, and then um, just the location and how to approach it. You can come in sort of like you would a, a hiatal hernia from below. And they were easily able to get in there. So that made it a, a much safer approach than trying to figure out a, a there's just no real good pathway percutaneously here. And you really don't want to try to get down, it's too far down for mediastinoscopy or anything else. So um, the graft was not during the uh, operating, and I read in the op note, the graft was not exposed, just that little, that little uh, so that what looks like this little pledget thing here turned out to be um, like a, a suture, like some kind of purple proline or something, a suture. Uh, so they they did take that out um, as a specimen, but um, the, they're going to treat the patient with antibiotics for a very long time and possibly for life for this. Gee. I think it's doxycycline these. I don't remember. It's rickettsial disease. So that's that's a coxiella abscess. And then this last case is really cool. I don't have a definitive answer, but it it, it came to a more interesting discussion. So I think you will all love this radiograph. So this is a young woman who originally is from West Africa um, and ha has a, a history of some latent TB, but no active TB, um, and has um, some shortness of breath, and on exam had some clubbing, and has this radiograph. And we can see that the right lung is, is small and it's hyperlucent. And there's some funny distortion around the, the airways here. Uh, this is a CT scan, and we're going to see... Uh, it looked like her left pulmonary artery was enlarged, too. Yes, relative to the right. Yes. Thank you, Travis. And I think you'll see why. Um, when we look on the CT scan here, we can see uh, well, there is a there's the pulmonary artery. So there is a right pulmonary artery, but the left one is a little bit bigger. But um, if we look at the, the lungs, you'll see that there's some bronchiectasis, but there's a lot of what looks like air trapping here on the right. There's the bronchiectasis, but you see patchy areas in the left lung as well, especially on the periphery. So mosaic attenuation, and then there's some scarring along the, the bronchovascular bundles. So it kind of has a Swire James appearance of the, the lateral hyperlucent lung. Um, but what was interesting is um, is that um, in one of the um, one of her evaluations, uh, when they noted the, the clubbing of her fingers, the patient had mentioned that uh, her father had the same condition. And one of our uh, pediatric uh, pulmonologists had mentioned that, you know, I, I mentioned just a Swire James appearance and queried an old infection in childhood. But um, the other thing you could think about is bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But we have no, we don't know if she was premature or not. And there's no record of it one way or the other. Um, but in my experience, BPD is usually more, you see more, it's usually not this asymmetric and you kind of get peripheral cystic stuff and scarring. But I guess that is a possibility since they, they do see it in kids. But he also raised the question of um, protein surfactant C deficiency. And he says they've seen cases in kids uh, who um, can develop what looks like a small airways involvement from it. And I think about more pulmonary familial fibrosis, um, but it can progress like this. Um, and given the family history of at least clubbing, there's a possibility that. So I think they're going to test her for that. But that's a new one for me as far as um, a cause of what looks like a Swire James McLeod syndrome. I don't know if anyone has any comments on this one. I would think yeah. more fibrosis. I mean, I don't know. And secondary airway dilation. I, I don't know why you would get primary airway issue with that. But, I don't know. You know. I don't, um, yeah, that's been his experience treating some of these kids. But I'll see if I can dig up any papers on it. But it's just really cool because this is, you know, one we always learn about in residency. I don't think I've ever seen a real case <laughs> other than in teaching files. But I think this would qualify at least partially. Okay, well, it is the hour, so thank you, everybody. Great cases this week. All right, take care. Yep, yeah, bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.